Good morning, church family. It is a blessing to read God's word together. We are in Exodus 40, verse 16 through 38. And Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned the fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle and he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tab tab tabernacle Oops. of the tent of meeting and it offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he had erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's so good. Uh, it's just so good to worship with you today, to be with you, to, to just be a part of what the Lord is doing here, uh, to be people that have been called by the Lord. And, and I've so enjoyed this study with you of the book of Exodus, and I want to congratulate you. You've made it. We are here at the end. We have finished the book. Obviously, we didn't look at every word. We jumped around. Uh, there's more that we could study and more that we'll come back to in, in years um, that are to come. Um, but this has just been a, such uh, a helpful study, and, and the text that we looked at today it's so important to understand what is going on in the book. When we first started this study, we said that Exodus is about the people of God, the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, going not just from bondage to freedom, but going from the service of Pharaoh, slavery to Pharaoh, to the service of the Lord, to the worship of the Lord. The book is actually about worship. It's, it's about being set free from the bondages of this world and being called into the right worship of God. And so it's, it's only appropriate that it would end here, that it would end with God among the people, calling the people to worship him, to know him, to experience his presence among them here in the tabernacle. Two things I want to look at as we think about the text today, that I think really apply to all of us. First, why the world needs a tabernacle. You know, you might be looking at this and, and saying, okay, you know, hold on. Tabernacles, smoke, fire, 
that sounds neat, but what does this have anything to do with my life? So I want to talk about that, why the world needs a tabernacle. And then secondly, where is it? How do you get to the tabernacle? How do you find the tabernacle? So, so why do we need a tabernacle? You know, I work out with these guys. Um, it's a neighborhood workout. We have a little shed, we have a bunch of weights and some jump ropes and some uh, kettlebells, I mean, those kinds of things. And I like working out with this group of guys because nobody's in that good of shape. And it kind of makes me feel good. I mean, I'm not that great of shape, so I kind of feel okay when I work out with them. And it's a bunch of middle-aged guys, and, and we, we'll meet at this, we meet in this little neighborhood area, and we work out for a little while, and then we have coffee before we all have to go take our kids to school. It's a great, you know, middle-aged dads kind of dad bod workout group that we have. Um, now, most of the guys in the group aren't super involved in church or, you know, very spiritual. Um, and so I've kind of become the pastor of this little workout group. And uh, these guys will ask me for spiritual advice. Uh, I had one guy ask me to, to officiate his wedding. I mean, I've kind of become the pastor of this little workout group. And I was talking to one of the guys the other day, and he'd gone to this funeral, and, and he was talking to me about the sermon, uh, the funeral sermon, because, you know, he thought, this is something I can connect with the pastor on. I listened to a sermon recently, right? But he didn't like the sermon, and he kind of talked about how silly the sermon was and, you know, didn't too much care for the preacher. But there was one point where he, he kind of lit up, and he said, you know, there was one part of the sermon I liked, uh, the person that had died, the, the funeral that he was attending, the person that had died had been in a wheelchair. And, and this guy that was telling me this story, his mom had been in a wheelchair. And he said, the pastor started talking about heaven. And he said, you know, in heaven, the, the lady that had died, she says, she'll be healed. She'll no longer be in a wheelchair. She'll no longer have need of a wheelchair. And he said, that really spoke to me. That kind of jumped out at me. Because, of course, you know, he thought about his own mother. You know, there's something in us. This guy's you know, not a theologian. He didn't even like the sermon. He doesn't, you know, he's not a super spiritual person. But there's something in all of us that our heart always jumps out at that, that we, we know that the Lord can fix things. We, we, we long for the day when things will be renewed, when the world will be restored. That, that idea that God may show up and restore us and fix us, we long for that, to, to quote Sam from Lord of the Rings, that, that all of the sad things might come untrue, right? There's something in us that longs for that to happen. We, we all hope for that kind of a restoration. I would even say it this way. We, we all long to be with God. We all have this longing for God. We, we have this longing to, to be right with God because when we're with God, Things are better. <laughs> Things are right. Things are restored. When the Bible talks about the new Jerusalem, this is, this is the image that it gives us. Revelation 21. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And what happens? He will dwell with them. They will be his people. He himself will be their God and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. There shall be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have all passed away. So it makes the new Jerusalem so great. We won't sin because we'll be with God. We won't be afraid because we'll be with God. We won't feel the effects of pain because we'll be with God. There, there is something in us that longs to be with God. We believe that God will restore. He'll make right. This is why this jumped out at my friend. One day there'll be no more need for wheelchairs. You know, Christopher Hitchens, he was one of the four horsemen of the new atheism. Uh, very brilliant writer. If you ever read him, he it was always interesting. He wrote for Vanity Fair and Atlantic, other publications. He was brilliant, but he basically spent most of his career trying to disprove the existence of God. He, he basically spent most of his career saying that those who believed in God, it was you're small minded, you're feeble, it was a phony thing. He kind of poked fun at anybody that would have, you know, a theistic vision of the world. Well, 2011, he, he died. He got esophageal cancer, and it killed him. And a few months before he died, this story has always stuck with me. A few months before he died, he was asked, what is your greatest fear? 
you know, he was approaching death. And I don't know what the interviewer had in mind. I don't know if they thought, is he going to say judgment? Is he going to say, you know, the pain of death? Well, what, what is he going to say? But he said that his greatest fear is that he would call out to God on his deathbed. His greatest fear. Now, this is a guy that's been his whole career, basically, most of his career, basically critiquing the idea of God. And he said that his greatest fear when he was approaching death is that he would call out to God on his deathbed. Now, that's an interesting question. Why was he afraid of that? I mean, if he didn't believe in God, why was he afraid that he might call out to God? And you know what I think? You know what I think? I think it's because he had called out to God before. I think it's because he had called out to God. There were other times in his life where he was sick or afraid or fearful or in financial trouble, and he had this inclination to call out to God, to pray, to ask God for his help. Now, you might say, hold on, Jason. <laughs> everybody does that, right? <laughs> Doesn't everybody do that? Like, that's just psychology. We're just trying to comfort ourselves. Everybody, when they get in trouble, will throw up a prayer to God. And to that statement, I would say, yes, I know. <laughs> they do do that. Even the most secular people I know. I mean, the, some of my most secular friends that will say, I mean, they will like clearly say, I do not believe in God to me. When their mom gets sick, they'll call me and say, hey, will you pray for my mom? And I want to say, I mean, I always say, yes, of course. I want to say, you don't believe in God. <laughs> like, What's wrong with you? In those moments when they're most afraid, when they feel most needy, they cry out to God. Now, some people say, well, I mean, that's psychology. They're just trying to comfort themselves. That's not their real self, right? But the Bible actually says the opposite. The Bible says it is their real self. The Bible says when we feel strong, when we feel wise, when we feel rich, when we feel healthy, when we're the most confident, that's when we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's when we have this courage to, to say there is no God, to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, to say, I'll go this way or that. It's, it's when we're sick, it's when we're poor, it's when we're needy, it's when we're afraid that we're actually most our true self, <laughs> That they're actually most honest. You could say, well, that's not their real self. No, the Bible says, no, that is their real self. It's not, it's not covered with all this confidence. That, that actually is when you're most honest with yourself. And I would say that to you. You know, I don't know who's here today, but there may be some people and you're kind of doubting the existence of God or, or something. I would just say, you know, you're, you're, the, the, the self that you can most trust is the weak self, <laughs> It's the self that's needy. That's desperate. That, that actually is revealing of where your heart actually is. That's when you actually know who you really are. That's when you're most honest with yourself. And we all, in those moments, cry out. Now, we're not alone if this is true of you. Here's the deal. If, if you've cried out to the Lord in a weak moment, every human has done this. Every civilization has always done this. We know that there is a God. But the other thing we know is that there is a separation between us and God. We, we know that it's not what Revelation 21 says, right? When we're with God, everything will be restored. With God, there'll be no crying. And with God, there'll be no pain. There'll be no death. We see pain. We see crying. We see death. We experience these things all the time. So we know there's a God, but we know that for some reason that he is distant, that, that we aren't quite connected to him. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, our lifelong longing is to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off. I love this. To be in the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside. This is no mere neurotic fancy. He says, this is the truest index of our real situation. I mean, Lewis is saying the same thing. This is the true, this is the true trueness of you. We long to be at last summoned inside, which would be both glory and honor beyond all our merits and also, I love this phrase, the healing of the old ache. You know the old ache? I know the old ache. The old ache. It's that little sorrow that's already always in your heart. It's that 
Here's what it is. It's that sense of separation from God. I mean, even in your best day, even on your greatest day, there's like a little bit of the old ache. It's what uh, Kierkegaard called the sickness unto death. The, The sickness that we all have. It's the ache of sin, this separation from God. We know that we should be crying out to God because deep down we know that we need God, but we know there's some barrier, right? We know we need God, but also, and then here's what it is, we kind of don't want God to show up right now. (laughs) God who knows all. I mean, this is what we just sang, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea because who wants to go before the throne of God above without a strong and perfect plea? Because all we have without Jesus is an imperfect plea. And it's not just an imperfect plea, it's a deeply flawed plea. It's no plea at all. It's all of our sin. It's our self-centeredness. It's our lack of worship. We know there's a God. We know that we should cry out to him. But actually, the, the thought of him coming close to us is also terrifying because he really knows us. And so because of this, what people have always done is they've always had a temple. They want to connect with God, but they know that they can't just connect with God in this unmediated way. And so the temple has always served as the mediator. The temple was the place where heaven and earth meet. And we, you know, we still kind of have this notion. Has anybody ever said to you, don't talk like that in church, right? Anybody ever said that? Or we're like, you can't wear that to church or you can't do that to church. Why? It's because I'm going to the mediated place, right? I'm going to the, the place where God is, not recognizing that I'll go ahead and break it to you. God is omnipresent, okay? But we still have that kind of old Temple mindset. I I need a mediated place where God kind of really is. And of course, we see this in all cultures. If you tour the ancient world, there's many ancient temples that still exist. And in a lot of cultures still to this day, of course, in Buddhist and Hindu traditions, there still, of course, is this idea of the temple. But this temple, this tabernacle was so active. It was it was different. It was the place of meeting. I mean, the Lord was there, and he, he was, it wasn't just Maybe the Lord here is here. They knew that the Lord was there. He assured them of their presence. I mean, the fire and the cloud was there. God was truly among them. God was dwelling among the people, which, which if you've been studying the book of Exodus, is an amazing thing. Now, again, I know we skipped a lot. Last week we were in Exodus 32, and you should be saying, what happened in Exodus 33? Well, I'll tell you. Exodus 33. Remember, remember Exodus 32, the idol, the calf? Exodus 33, God says to Moses, this stiff-necked people, I can't dwell among them. I can't go among them because if I go among them, I'll consume them, right? This is the holiness of God and the unholiness of the stiff-necked Hebrew people. God said, if I go among them, I'll consume them. So what what happened is God met outside of the people, the tent of meeting with Moses. But even Moses, I mean, even for Moses, God was too holy. You know, Moses wanted, this is also in Exodus 33, God wanted, or Moses wanted to see God, and God said, look, you can't see my face. If you saw my face, you would die. And so what God does is this famous story. He puts Moses in the cleft of a rock. And he, in, in, a, in a sense, the, the rock covers Moses. Where we get the old song, Rock of Ages, if you know that old hymn. And, and Moses is covered by the rock, so as God passes by, he doesn't die. And then as God passes by, Moses just can glimpse at the, at the, at the back of God, kind of as he's moving along. The, the point I'm trying to make here is God is saying, I can't dwell among the people without consuming them. My holiness is too great for them. I can't dwell among them. And so the tabernacle for the people becomes a veil for the glory of God. You you can almost think about it this way. The the tabernacle protects the people from the power of God's glory. It's a veil over them. It's a veil over God, in a sense, that protects the people from the fullness of the glory of God. And and this isn't going to be a super technical sermon. I, I thought, man, do I go technical, technical, piece by piece, or more high level? I went high level, but... There's a lot of pieces in this passage, and they all serve as veils. The, the ark itself is a veil. The glory of God was in the ark. It, it veiled, in a sense, the glory of God. It shielded the people from his power, the tablets in the ark, the law of God. In a sense, the law is a veil. It, it's saying that it's only by holiness can we come near to the Lord. The mercy seat is a veil. It's only by sacrifice that we can know God. The veil the veil that separated the most 
holy place, the holy of holies from the, the rest of the tabernacle, it was, it was a veil. The veil was a veil. The priesthood, in a sense, was a veil, right? The, the, the people had to have a mediated interaction with God. They, they couldn't just, nobody could just walk in to the holy place where God was. The sacrificial system was a veil, right? It was only by blood. It was only by a sacrifice that, that, that God could dwell among the people. There was a washing system that was a veil. Even the, the showbread and the bread, it was, it was a reminder of their dependence on the Lord. There was all of these things in the tabernacle to remind them of the power and the holiness and the weightiness, the kavod of God. God couldn't be near his people in an unveiled way. Of course, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest went in to the holy place, it, it was so glorious that, that after this great process of, of cleansing and washing and prayers, could, only could he go in. The, the, the glory of God was, was too holy, was too powerful for a sinful people. But despite all this veiling, God was still among them. And this was grace. I mean, without God, they're dead, Without God, they're, they're trapped in this wilderness, but God was with them. He was protecting them, and more than that, he was guiding them. I love the way this ends. As the, as the cloud lifted, as the fire lifted, the people followed, and the people knew when it was time to move, and the people knew when it was time to act, and the people knew where they were to go by the gracious leading of the Spirit of God, by the gracious communion that they shared with God. Here's the deal. We need a temple We were made to be with God, but sin has separated us. We have this old ache. We have this sickness unto death. We need some way that we could be rejoined, reunited with God. But for us, the question we should be asking now is where is our temple, right? Where is the place? How does God dwell among us? How can we know this holy God? And that, of course, gets me to point number two. Where can you find the temple Where can you connect with the transcendent? Where can you know the holiness of God? You know, it's interesting all that people do to try to connect with God. If uh, you know know me, you know, especially when I was younger, I I love adventure. I spent a lot of time rafting and hiking and uh, fishing and skiing and doing sorts of outdoor things. And and, and that community of folks, uh, like the granola type, you know, they... It's not just recreation to them. I mean, if you, if you get to know people, a lot of people that are whitewater rafting guides or fishing guides or skiing guides, it, it's not just recreation for a lot of those people. It's, it's worship, right? They've kind of settled into this pantheistic, you know, understanding of, in a sense, they're saying, I'm in the temple. The reason I'm out here, the reason, you know, that I'm, you know, a whitewater rafting guide at, you know, age 55 is I'm... Worshiping, you know, I've given myself to the priesthood in a sense. I've given myself to the to the worship of God. This is how I connect with God in this place. And of course, it's not just the earthy or granola types that that seek transcendence. I read this quote from Gordon Gecko, the character played by Michael Douglas in the old Wall Street movies. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge has marked the upward surge. Greed marks the upward surge of mankind, he says. Greed liberates and will save the USA. I mean, that's not just talk. That's worship. I mean, this is what saves us. This is what liberates us. This is what brings us up. Um, Whitney Houston, you know, don't let me close one more door. I don't want to hurt anymore. I have nothing, nothing, nothing. If I don't have you, what is that? That's not just a romance. That's, that's liberation. That's worship. That's, you see, it, it doesn't have to be Jerusalem. It could be the Grand Canyon, <laughs> It could be Wall Street. It could be a great first date. But people go to all sorts of things to connect with the transcendent, to to worship, to feel connected to to God. The tabernacle, now of course that we read about here, 
would eventually become the, we kind of got the mood lighting now. I like this. All right. Start singing Whitney Houston and, you know. But the tabernacle that we read about, of course, it would eventually become the temple in Jerusalem. And, of course, it was a major theme. I mean, if you study the Old Testament, the temple's a major theme. I mean, the temple is a big theme, and not just in the narrative, but also in the prophets. And, and what you're supposed to take when you, when you study about the temple, what you should be getting, especially when you start studying the prophecy, is that the temple, great as it was, was only a signpost. It was only a picture of something more to come, especially if you study Ezekiel, you're, you're, you should get that there's some greater temple that is to come. Now, what a lot of people thought was that that greater temple was Herod's temple. If you go to, uh, we're going to Israel in the spring. If you go and see the old structure of the old temple, the, it was the greatest temple in the ancient world. I mean, the greatest ancient temple ever built was the temple that was there in the time of Jesus. It was amazing. And the people were so proud of it. They, they loved it. And they said, now we know that we are the ones. We know God. Look at this temple that we have. They were so proud of their temple. It was their, it was their identity. It was their place of transcendence. It was their hope, Herod's great temple. And the thing that really got Jesus in trouble, when you think about all the accusations that were brought against him when he was being put on trial, the one that stuck the people the hardest, the one that made the people the maddest, you know what it was? They kept saying, he said he would tear the temple down and raise it in three days. Now, he didn't actually say that. <laughs> he said, if you tear the temple down, I'll raise it in three days. And of course, he was talking about his body. But the fact that he would talk about tearing down the temple was so offensive. It was so vile. It was so horrible for them. But I'll tell you, the thing that Jesus said that was really radical wasn't that the temple would be torn down. is that a new temple would be raised up. What he was saying what he was really saying to them, this temple that you had so much hope in, this place of transcendence, it's being replaced. There's a new temple, and it's me. <laughs> I am the temple. I am the place where heaven and earth meet. I am the way of salvation. I am the mediating place. The, the way that you can know God now is not through a physical place. It's through me. It's through my death. It's through my resurrection. That's where you meet God. That's where you become clean. And even though after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the actual physical temple in Jerusalem would stand for another 40 years, there was a sign that what Jesus was saying was exactly true. Because when he died and yelled out that it is finished, the curtain, the veil... The veil that separated the holy place of God from the rest of the temple was torn from top to bottom. This dramatic and powerful way. Jesus is the true temple. And, and as we studied the Old Testament and, and understood this greater temple was coming, what we were to really understand that it was Jesus. All the functions of the temple were all pointing to Jesus. They're all resolved in Jesus. Jesus is the true tablets. He's the ultimate fulfillment of God's law. Jesus is the true ark. He is the place where the Spirit of God dwells. Jesus is the true mercy seat, the place where God's mercy is known because of the sacrifice of his love. Jesus is the true priest, the one who goes before God and makes an appeal for us. Jesus himself is the true sacrifice, making a sacrifice for God by his own blood. He's the true showbread. He's the bread of life. He's the true lamp. He's the light of the world. He's the true veil, the way to the holiness of God. It was all pointing to Jesus, and it's all been accomplished in Jesus. Jesus is the true temple. And because we have such a temple in Jesus, and I want you to hear this, because we have such a temple in Jesus, we now in Jesus can know God in an unveiled way. The author of Hebrews says it this way, therefore, brothers, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, do you understand what kind of an invitation this is? Anyone in the Old Testament reading this or that understood the Old Testament, reading Hebrews, they would have been blown away by this invitation. You and you and you and you and you through Jesus can enter into the holy place of God. 
You can look upon the glory of God in an unveiled way. We have confidence, not in a terrified way. I mean, think about the Day of Atonement. They would tie the rope around the high priest's ankle because he was terrified to go in there because he might die. and Nobody else was going to go in there and get him. You, in Christ, can now enter into the holy place. You can go before the very presence of God with confidence by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that God has opened for us through the curtain that is the flesh of Christ. And since we have this great high priest, this this high priest who identifies with us and loves us in every way, this great new high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, full of assurance, with our hearts sprinkled clean, not ashamed of our sin, but we know that we we have sin. We are confident that our sin has been dealt with in the cross of Christ. So we, we can go before God with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Our bodies washed with pure water. In Jesus, we can know God. We can experience communion with God. Remember Lewis, our lifelong longing? You know this. I know this. Our lifelong longings to be reunited with something in the universe which we we feel cut off. To be on the inside of the door, which we've always felt on the outside. We long to be at last summoned inside, which would be both glory and honor beyond all our merits and also healing of the old ache. (laughs) Good news, fellow old achers. Good news, friend with the sickness unto death. I have it too. Good news to those of you who have longed to be summoned on the inside What your heart was longing for was to be united with God, and the invitation of Christ by His blood has come in. Come in. The door is open. Behold the glory of God. Commune with God. Come and behold the glory of God. You know, in the days of the tabernacle, there was all this stuff you had to do. I mean, it's all there for a reason. Again, I didn't get super technical, but it's all there for the reason. The showbread. Okay, God has provided for us the wilderness. The cleansing. I'm going to wash myself. I'm going to wash my feet and hands because they're dirty. The sacrificial system, the altar, the table. I'm going to have to do those. Then there's the veil. I have to do all this stuff to get in. I have to clean my life to, to try to get in. And you know, a, lot of, a lot of maybe even you here today, you have this perception of what Christianity is. i got to clean my life up to go to church. That's why people like the 5 o'clock service. I always say, I mean, some of you all might be here, but I always say I like the 5 o'clock service because that's where the people that you know, they're, they're afraid to come to the 11 o'clock service, you know. They're like, well, I'll go to the five. There may be less Christians there. And that's the way people feel. It's like I got to clean myself up to get in. And if I get clean enough, then maybe. You know, this is saying the exact opposite. That's the way the old tabernacle worked. But this new temple, this Jesus temple, Jesus says, no, it's, it's by my righteousness and my blood by my sacrifice, that you are, through faith, welcome to come in and behold the glory of God. And and as you behold the glory of God, then you will be made clean. It's the exact opposite. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. When one turns to the Lord, when one turns to the Lord through simple faith, this is the invitation to you today, through simple faith. If you're seeking today and you're saying, what does it mean to come into this temple? Turn to the Lord. Repent of your sin and look to Jesus. Believe that he loves you. Believe that his his blood covers you. Believe that the power of his resurrection can be applied to you through simple faith. When one turns to the Lord, here's the invitation. The veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is, and here's the word, freedom. And we all, those of us in Christ, we all With an unveiled face, all the veils are gone. We can behold the glory of the Lord and be transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. Jesus has said, come in, experience my love, be forgiven, be accepted, know the glorious glories of the creator God. And as you do, and as you know these things, and as you commune with God, guess what? Day Day by day by day, glory by glory by glory, degree by degree by degree, you'll be transformed. You'll share in the image of Christ. And, and, and it goes even further. I've got an and on this one. 
That's the most amazing thing that I could have ever said to anyone, and there's even more. Jesus says, it's not only that you're welcome to behold the glory of God in me, through faith in me. You can't just behold the glory of God, but more than that. You can't just come into the temple, (laughs) more than that. But Jesus says, it's now you will become the temple. That the dwelling place of the Spirit of God will now be those who look to him in faith. Will now be the very ones that behold the glory of God. Jesus is not just invited us to behold the glory of God, but to experience the glory of God, to be the temple ourselves. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. What, what Paul means by this In the Old Covenant, the the Spirit of God dwelled in the veiled tabernacle. It was in this temple built with hands. That's how God's temple, God's presence, God's Spirit was among them. And again, it was a terrifying place. The people couldn't come near it. It it had to be veiled. What Paul is saying here, what the the New Testament says of us in Christ, what this promise of the empowering work of the Holy Spirit of God says to you is that in Christ... You have been made so pure, you have been made so clean, you have been declared so righteous that now the Spirit of God can't just come close to you, you can't just behold the work of God, but rather the Spirit of God can literally indwell you without killing you. It's an amazing thing to believe. And if that is true, even for stiff-necked people like us, It'll totally change us. You are the temple in Christ. You are the dwelling place of God. Not a temple of stone, but a temple, a living temple, a people purified by Christ, trusting in the finished work of Christ. Now, I want you to hear this. This is my only chance. This is my only chance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in, can I, can I have a word of confession? You know, the older I get, the more I realize that I'm a complete idiot. The, the older I get, the more I realize how in my flesh I desire the stupidest stuff. How I desire the shortest little things. The older I get, the, the more I realize how how much I don't desire to worship God. <laughs> and, how I, and, and how so often I'm so good at like pretending to worship God so people will think, wow, he's a good guy that worships God. But really I just want, the, the, the treasure I'm really after is the person saying that he's a good guy rather than the treasure of actually worshiping and knowing God. That, that, what's wrong with me? Well, why am I so selfish? Well, why, why don't I love people without expecting something in return. What, what, is, what is wrong with me? And here's the deal. The older I get, the more I realize that without the Spirit of God in me, <laughs> unless the Spirit of God in me convicted me of these things and showed me my sin, I, I could never love anyone. I could never do anything that was righteous. I wouldn't. No, it's, it's, only, it's only because of this that God in his kindness has, has actually sent the Spirit of God that convicts me of sin. That, that points me to what is righteous, that, that gives me this desire for good things, that this doesn't come from me. This, this only is God's indwelling grace in my life. I would be like the Israelites, totally lost in the wilderness. I, would, I wouldn't go the right way ever. It's only by the Spirit's power in my life that anything good can come out of this shell of a life called Jason D's. And and, you know, here's the deal. You don't want to admit it. I don't even want to say it to you because I like you. But the same is true of you. And the same is true of you. And the same is true for this whole church. Christ's covenant's nothing. Christ's covenant's so empty and shallow and weak and stupid unless we're a spirit-filled church. And sadly, there's a lot of organizations that call themselves churches 
that the Spirit does not indwell. And they're just going through the motions and they're just doing a thing and it's, it's, it's silly. But if we ever want to be the kind of people that actually, let's just start, let's start at the basics, that can actually love one another in a self-sacrificing, self-giving way. We are so dependent on the Spirit. If we want to be the kind of people that can actually be righteous, that can do things that please the Lord, that love the things that God loves, and not just in a self-righteous way, not just so we can look down at our nose at other people, we, we need the Spirit of God. If we ever want to be the kind of people that God can use to transform this city, that he can use for his mission, for all of his purposes, we are so desperate for the Spirit's leading that God in his grace would dwell among us and be in us. And that can only happen as we look to Jesus. Because look, with, without Jesus, we have no place. The Spirit will kill us. We have no place before God. So, church, let's keep looking to Jesus. I love what John Owen says. Let's look to Jesus by faith so that one day we can look to him by sight. I want all things to be made new. I do. (laughs) I want to be with the Lord. I want my heart to always see things as it should. (laughs) And one day it will. One day in a totally unmediated way, we will be with the Lord as long as we stay faithful to looking to Jesus, living by the guiding power of his Holy Spirit. Let's stay faithful in these things. May God do it among us. Let me pray. (sighs) Father, we're such a mess. Were it not for your gospel, we're such a mess without the... Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Lord, we're such a mess without you, without your grace. We know we need you, and and actually in our best moments, we cry out to you. In In our best moments, we cry out to you, Lord. And Lord, you respond. You you have mediated this grace with us. You've mediated this covenant with us through the perfect high priest the perfect temple, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus the Lord. And because his mediation for us was so complete and so full, it is finished, it's so final. And now your Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, can literally indwell us and guide us and lead us. You can dwell among us without, without killing us, Lord. And so we thank you for this grace. I pray that we would live by the Spirit and be free in the Spirit, Lord. Use your word, use these songs, use this time of communion, Lord, to to make these things more sure in our hearts. And I pray this in Jesus' name.